This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. On a dark winter night in 1992, high school senior Kelly Day Wilson finished her shift at NTV, Northeast Texas Video, a movie rental store on the town square in Gilmer, Texas. Kelly locked up the shop with manager Joe Henry. I say, do you open tomorrow? And she says, yes. And I said, okay, I'll see you. That was the last time anyone is known to have seen Kelly. The mom called me about six the next morning and asked me if... Uh, she'd gone anywhere I said yes she'd gone to this girl's house and uh, that's all I knew at the time that was a little bit disturbing to me uh, but that, I didn't think much about it Kelly and one of her friends a fellow student at Gilmer High School had made plans to attend a party together a party out of town Kelly never showed at 7am Kelly's mom Kathy called the police department she got on the phone with a veteran sergeant named James York Brown From the get-go, Sergeant Brown wondered if Kelly simply ran away from home. He asked Kathy and her husband, Robert, to come down to the station to file a missing persons report. Then Sergeant Brown drove over to look at Kelly's car. Her gold Dodge Charger was still parked beside the video store. There was a bottle of vodka inside the car. The keys were missing. No signs of a struggle, but the left rear tire had been slashed. The tire had even come off the rim. That's an important detail. Obviously, Kelly, or someone, had tried to drive the car before realizing it was flat. After closing up the video store with Joe, Kelly's last task of the night would have been to drop off all the cash from that day's movie rentals. The bank was just a couple of blocks northeast of the store, and when Sergeant Brown checked with the bank, sure enough, the nightly deposit had been made. The tire has probably been slashed by this time. It's not known if she backed out started off in the tire flat and pulled back in, or if she went all the way around to the bank to do the deposit and then come back in. Kelly's parents were divorced. Her dad and stepmom, Robbie and Waverlin, lived in the town of Natchitoches, Louisiana, which is about two and a half hours southeast of Gilmer. That winter, Kelly had been telling her friends that she was moving back to Louisiana, where she'd spent most of her childhood. Had she left Gilmer without saying goodbye? Kathy called Waverlin. Waverlin called Robbie. I won't say it was like eight or nine o'clock in the morning. Waverlin called me at work. He said, told me a little bit, and I, you know, I told my people I had to go. Came home. We got packed up. We went to, we went to uh, Gilman. So you, you were worried at that point. Oh yeah. Robbie had always felt that his daughter was just a little too trusting. Kelly never met a stranger. She was very, very outgoing. Probably to her own. You know, it concerned me a little bit because she, like, again, she never, I mean, she could go up to a perfect stranger and strike a conversation and uh, just like she'd known him all of her life. Best I can remember, we went straight to the police station and talked to, to uh, Sergeant Brown. Sergeant Brown was lean and lanky. He rocked a dark brown mustache and aviator sunglasses. Picture a local cop from like an 80s movie. That's James Brown. Uh, he's a fairly typical small town police officer from what I could, you know, be the way I'd describe him. He kind of ran us through what they had had so far. Uh, pretty much the basics of the story. She, you know, she had closed the store. She, she, her car had been moved from where it was originally parked, assuming that she had taken the, the bank deposits to the bank, which they were made. Uh, and her car was back at the store in it, but in a different parking slot. I think there was a, I think her purse was still in the car. There was, a, I think if I remember right, a vodka bottle in the car. There was, uh, I, you know, who knows how long that stuff had been there. Her purse probably was there, but that, you know, which, but, and that's pretty much about it. Really, why why they didn't impound the car, treat it as a crime scene? I mean, they they were treating everything as just a common, ordinary, everyday missing person, runaway type 
thing rather than a crime scene. So there was a lot of probably potential evidence that could have been collected that wasn't. Uh, Hard to imagine a teenage girl running away without her purse. Yeah. Or without her car. Why wouldn't she take her car? <laughs> uh, you know, unless, unless somebody, you know, abducted her. What else do you she voluntarily left for somebody else? You know, that would be the only two scenarios I could come up with. That's what a lot of people thought at first. Maybe Kelly couldn't decide which household to live in, so she skipped town with a boyfriend. I just remember in the beginning, it was a, she ran off. They just kept saying, oh, she ran off with some boy. That's Kelly's friend from high school, Lee. It was a lot of, she's a, a wild child. She definitely just ran off with some boy for the first couple days, I believe. I, I feel like it took them a couple of days before they took it seriously. That mindset was about to shift. The bank where everybody thought Kelly made the deposit right before she disappeared had a security camera. Sergeant Brown got hold of the footage. It showed three vehicles making deposits around the time that Kelly would have left the video store. None of the vehicles was an 85 Dodge Charger, though. Nor did any of the drivers look like Kelly. Although the video quality was so bad, it was hard to know for sure. I just had a feeling, an uh, ominous feeling that this was not going to end well. And that, uh, I can't tell you why I had that feeling. I just had that. And as unfortunately, it turned out to be pretty true. Robbie had no idea how bad it was going to get. It's the story of a missing teenage girl. The search to find her would change the lives of just about everyone she knew. Bizarre turn of events in this case of missing Gilmer teen Kelly Wilson. She told me to be careful that uh, I could end up like Kelly Wilson. That struck, put fear in me. So there was devil worshiping back in the woods. Right behind your house? Yeah, further back in the woods. The details are sketchy. The trail goes cold, and Kelly Wilson vanishes forever. In the small town of Gilmer, everyone wants to know what happened to Kelly Wilson. From Imperative Entertainment, I'm Wes Ferguson. This is Devil Town. Elizabeth I is presented by Rakuten, the most rewarding way to shop. Shop through Rakuten for everyday essentials and big ticket items alike. Clothing and shoes, toys and games, electronics, travel and kitchen or home essentials. Rakuten is the smartest and most rewarding way to shop and save. You can earn cash back at over 3,500 stores. Here's the best part. Membership is free and it's easy to sign up. Rakuten deposits your cash back directly into your PayPal account or they can send you a check. It's absolutely a no-brainer. You earn cash back for what you were already shopping for. So start all of your shopping at Rakuten. Your cash back really does add up. Rakuten has 15 million members who are already saving. Get the free Rakuten app and download the free browser extension to make it even easier to save. Rakuten also finds you the best deals, sales, and coupons. Head to Rakuten.com now or download the Rakuten app to start saving today. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. There is a woman who went the distance, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I'm Katy Perry. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth the First. Elizabeth the First, the podcast. Wherever you listen. This is Chapter 2. The Devil Comes to Town. It's been 30 years since Kelly Wilson walked out of Northeast Texas video and vanished into the night. I was a kid back then. Now I'm trying to answer a question that seems so simple, and yet, it's bedeviled the town of Gilmer for decades. And still no answers in the disappearance of Kelly Wilson. Leaving the city wondering, 
Will they ever know? That's all anyone can say for certain. Kelly Wilson has vanished. From day one, Sergeant James York Brown led the investigation. He probably knows more about Kelly's disappearance than anyone else. But this case changed his life. It nearly broke him. To this day, some folks in Gilmer wonder if Sergeant Brown knows more than he's letting on. I mailed Sergeant Brown a letter and called a few times. Nothing. One day, I even tried to drive by his house to knock on his front door. He lives way out in the country now. The map on my phone sent me far off course, to a pine forest in the middle of nowhere, not a house in sight. Kelly's mom, Kathy, had already decided not to talk to me. Without Sergeant Brown, I'd probably never find out what happened to Kelly. Then I dove a little deeper into Facebook and Reddit comments about the case. They were full of finger pointing and amateur investigators. James York Brown was a prime suspect in the eyes of some. Here are a few examples. I still think it was the cop. To me, he was so creepy. He was in it up to his ears. One of the commenters caught my attention. This guy was feisty. Plenty of bad information here. I'd be proud to set some things straight. I lost good years of my childhood to this case. He is my father. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Sergeant Brown has a son. His name is Josh. I found a phone number. Oh, I've been mad. Yeah, I've been mad. I've, e- I've even questioned my own dad. Just out of, out of fury, out of, out of fucking lost time, and just... <sighs> just being just flat out mad, you know, trying to figure out why. I've questioned that. My brother's questioned that. We, my brother and I have both questioned each other. Just, you know, we wanted to know what we were shielded from. But I can guarantee you that, uh, I can guarantee you he didn't do it. Josh's mom and dad split up when he was a toddler. He was eight when his dad took on Kelly's case. They, they've they been divorced as long as I can remember. You know, I'd go see dad on the weekends, first, third, and fifth. Back then, Sergeant Brown was always on the job whether he was in uniform or not. He had a brown Trans Am. And, uh, you know, we we would go ride the back roads on the weekend. And uh, I didn't know this, but, you know, he was, he was looking. I remember he would talk to people when we were just, you know, quote, riding around. And he would ask them, hey, you know, you seen anything, you know, He was always asking questions. You know, anybody and everybody that, you know, everybody, Gilmer's a small town. Josh and I had been talking for a while. I had to ask. Do you think he'd want to talk to me? I don't know that he would. I think he's, I think he's pretty well done with that stage in his life. That, you know, he, he's moved on from that. Really doesn't want anything to do with it. I will call him and ask him. And see if he'll do one more interview. However, my request, if I'm going to do that for you, give us the direction it's going to be geared. Because if you're going to try to make him look like a criminal, yeah, we ain't got much use for that. Josh and I hung up. Minutes later, the phone buzzed in my pocket. Josh again. He had his dad on the line. I scrambled to find my recorder. Hey, uh... Mr. Brown, thank you so much for uh, being willing to get on the phone with me. Uh, my name is... Hey, hey, before you get started, Wes, I want you to understand, you've, uh, <clears throat> I've talked to Dad, and uh, you've got a few minutes, and if he gets uncomfortable, um, I told him to hang up, or he can say, hey, I don't feel comfortable, and hang up. So, understood. get started. Understood, and, uh, and I won't um, take too much of your time. Sergeant Brown, James, had been a cop for several years in Gilmer before he answered the call to search for Kelly Wilson. He believed in his mission to serve and protect. And that, that was the whole reason of being in law enforcement anyway, or in my opinion it is, is to help people and protect them and 
I mean, I, I went to shootings and bandaged people up until they get the ambulance. They hold. Hopefully they survive it. You know, it didn't matter if they were the bad guy or the good guy. It was just your job was to protect people. It didn't take him long to realize that Kelly's situation was more dire than a case of a teenage runaway. Usually if somebody runs from their home or was a runaway or usually you can find them within five or six days. But then, from what I understood, uh, she was supposed to live with her father in Louisiana. And when he told me that, I said, oh, this don't look good at all because usually a person don't deviate from where they want to go. Uh, they could have run away or anything could have happened. But you start at that point and then you go from where the last place was. And, you know, even in this case, there was problems with that because the vehicle was tampered with by the stepfather and mother of her at that time before we were notified. Kelly's stepdad, Robert, not to be confused with Kelly's dad, Robbie, probably didn't give a second thought to grabbing the purse when he found Kelly's unlocked car beside the video store. But in Sergeant Brown's opinion, Robert had already compromised the crime scene. The purse was in the possession of the mother. They had already went through that car before we got there. She had to start at zero because you don't know what was removed from a vehicle or, or anything. Sergeant Brown didn't really think the car held any clues, so he turned his search elsewhere. That meant interviewing everyone he could find. You talk to people that were there at the store, you talk to people outside. You, I mean, there's a lot of interviews that were done with last people that had contact. And from there, you start narrowing your focus. And of course, I wasn't alone in the investigation. Enter Philip Williams. About two or three days after she disappeared, he called me and said, I need some help. I distinctly remember him saying that. Philip Williams was, and is, a newspaper reporter in Gilmer. You heard from him in the first episode. And then he told me, we've got this missing girl. To spread the word, Philip wrote a news article that described Kelly. Blue eyes, sandy blonde hair, five foot seven, 120 pounds. She was last seen wearing blue jean cutoff shorts and a purple rugby shirt with a white collar and white sleeve bands. Sergeant Brown also called the Texas Rangers, Louisiana police, and the FBI, looking for help anywhere he could find it. The FBI helped run down leads and interview people. There had been a few skateboarders out that night on the town square. According to at least one news report, a handful of people told police they saw Kelly go back into the video store after she discovered her flat tire. But apparently, no one saw what happened after that. Asking around, Sergeant Brown found out that one of Kelly's tires also had been slashed that Friday, two nights before she vanished. Another girl who worked with Kelly at the video store also had one of her tires slashed on Saturday, just one night before. Maybe the slashed tire was related. Maybe not. Another baffling detail has to do with that bank deposit. For some reason, Sergeant Brown told the news media that Kelly was shown on the security camera making the deposit, even though the camera didn't really show that. I guess it's possible she walked two blocks to make the deposit off camera, but that seems unlikely given that it was dark and pretty cold in Gilmer that night. If not Kelly then, who dropped off the money? I'll let them carry my truck through to eliminate it. That's Joe Henry again, the store manager. We went and drove through, did the, we had to do that twice, but that screwed up. Did that twice, so they eliminated my truck. Sergeant Brown, the FBI, and Texas Rangers all interviewed Joe. Joe was a bachelor in his mid-30s. He and Kelly had been alone on her last night at the video store. Was he hiding something? Did you get the impression that they were asking some certain questions because they were trying to decide if you were a suspect? Yeah, oh, yeah. Suspect. <laughs> but they were very, very nice. I mean, yes, because, I mean, you start, I'm, I'm the proverbial last person to see her. That's, that's the, you know, I wasn't, but whatever happened was the last person. But I'm the proverbial last person to see her. So we start with me and you work the way out. Well, we went through all this stuff and it was very hard, very difficult because 
I'd gone home that night. My mom was home. The next door neighbor saw me come home. I got out the grocery store. I went and bought some stuff for my mom to cook, some frozen stuff. Went home, took a shower, ate supper, called my girlfriend, talked to her. She called me back in a little bit, and this was crazy. And asked me, says, your dog in the yard? And I thought, yeah, I think so. Kind of random. So I got up to look out the window, and there he was, you know, and, and her name was Angela. She's since passed away. But uh, but all these people, and I tried to say, y'all go talk to these people. We don't need to, it's hard. So I thought, well, okay. I mean, I, I had never had any experience with anything like this before. And this is just terrifying, you know. But yeah, but they were very courteous, and I did what they told me to and all that. And, and we went through any time they wanted to talk, we talked. Everybody in town knew Joe, and not just from the video store or his burger joint around the block. Joe was from a good family with deep ties in Gilmer. He also had a solid alibi. Pretty soon, he was more or less eliminated from the list of suspects, at least in the eyes of law enforcement. Although Joe says he remained in touch with Sergeant Brown and the FBI. And called James would tell me some things. We were kind of confident with each other. After kind of we got over the hurdle of me, and I'm not an officer they ever quit looking at me in that respect. But after a while, it changed, and uh, they would come over here and eat lunch, and we would talk. And uh, I told the guy I felt bad about that, about not staying an extra 10 minutes or whatever. He said, you cannot blame yourself. He said, that is not your problem. He said, I know it's a bad situation, but he said, you can't, you can't put yourself in that situation that if you had been there, this wouldn't have happened. I mean, it's just, you just can't speculate on that kind of stuff. Winding through the woods northwest of Gilmer is a narrow, and some would say, mysterious road named the Cherokee Trace. It's much older than all the other roads in the area. In fact, Cherokee Indians blazed the trail more than two centuries ago, supposedly by dragging buffalo skins through the brush. To this day, it remains a lonely, out-of-the-way blacktop lane meandering out of town for several miles. In this story, the Cherokee Trace will come up again and again. One month after Kelly disappeared, 300 volunteers and a pack of search dogs combed the woods near Cherokee Trace. The spot was a popular hangout for local teens. What's more, a new reservoir, Gilmer Lake, was being planned for the area. The searchers found some mounds of recently turned earth, but it turned out that a team of archaeologists had been digging for Indian relics. There were no signs of Kelly. Sergeant Brown kept up the search on his own time. Meanwhile, Kelly's dad and stepmom practically moved to Gilmer. It seemed like every every weekend there for quite a few months, we were over there. You know, we would follow a lead or just find a place and search. I mean, it was just, you know, you felt like you had to do something. Finally, in late April, Sergeant Brown seemed to get his first real break. A high school dropout named Michael Bybee confessed to slashing Kelly's car tire on the night she vanished. Bybee, who was 17 years old at the time, was arrested on a misdemeanor charge of criminal mischief. The guy that slashed her tire, he was brought into court, pled guilty. Um, and uh, to a misdemeanor, and I was there when he was sentenced, but apparently, through a remarkable coincidence, he had nothing to do with her disappearance. He slashed her tire, she disappears, but he didn't have anything to do with the disappearance as far as the law was concerned. That's quite the coincidence. Mm. Michael Bybee moved out of state a long time ago. I've tried really hard to reach him, Phone calls, emails. He blocked me on Facebook. Ultimately, police decided his tire slashing was just a random act of vandalism. Police were back to square one. That spring, high school graduation came and went with no sign of Kelly. The Gilmer class of 92 dedicated the ceremony to their missing classmate. In the news, Sergeant Brown maintained that he was still interviewing people and pursuing leads. But reading between the lines, It seemed like the case had gone cold. Desperate for clues, Sergeant Brown was about to take a trip to the spirit world. Hi, Sergeant Brown, is it? It is. Hi, Sergeant Brown. How you doing? Just fine. Well, James, uh, have you ever worked with a psychic before? Uh, no, ma'am. 
James Brown dialed a psychic. Influencer. It's a word that gets tossed around a lot these days. But what exactly is an influencer? Well, there is a woman who went the distance, who went beyond the dazzle, who broke ground as the first true influencer by living a remarkable life. She had power, real power, and longevity, influencing generations. Her name, Elizabeth Taylor. I know she was loud. I know she was hysterically funny. I know she swore. But Elizabeth said how painfully shy she was. She went on perfume tours, and the places were mobbed just to see her. She was starting to try and take control of her life, but then tragedy and life kind of got in the way. I'm Katy Perry, and Elizabeth Taylor has fascinated, inspired, and influenced me as an artist, woman, and an advocate. This is the story of the original influencer. This is Elizabeth I. With the search for their daughter seeming to stall out, Kelly's parents had asked Sergeant James York Brown of the Gilmer Police Department to seek help from none other than Noreen Rainier, a psychic detective in Florida. Here's Ms. Rainier being interviewed for a YouTube show just last year. Welcome to Paranormal Yacker. My guest today is psychic detective Noreen Rainier. She is the only psychic ever to lecture at the FBI Academy and has assisted law enforcement officials all over the world. I've been shot with a shotgun and I've been a male in male parts. I've, I've had my throat slit many times, stabbed in the head. Uh, and, and for some reason, while I'm in this sort of trance state, uh, I don't get upset. Rainier is famous for her paranormal services. She's worked on more than 600 unsolved cases and even lectured at the FBI Academy in 1981. Believe it or not, using psychics on missing persons cases at that time was a thing. The Atlanta child murders, where many young black boys went missing at the hands of a mysterious killer, most famously used psychics to help scour the woods for bodies around the Atlanta area in the early 1980s. The Gilmer police sent Noreen a tennis shoe, scarf, belt, necklace, and watch, all items that had belonged to Kelly. This is an actual recording from the psychic session with Sergeant Brown. Now I'm going to ask Noreen to relax, be with Kelly, see Kelly. What does describe Kelly for? Uh, I'm more short than tall, the more short. Uh, around her, a pretty prettiness in, in her face. Sergeant Brown was on the other end of the line. It went on like that for a while. Tell us what you're feeling. Seeing this killer, want to know only about the killer. This killer. Relax. Tell us what you feel. Tell us what you feel. Oh, my stomach. My stomach is causing me to pain. I'm not about to kill you or the murderer, but I'm, I'm having a tremendous amount of pain in my stomach. Go beyond the pain now. Oh, God. You want to go beyond the pain, relax. Things were pushed up me. Go beyond the pain. Oh, Come back to Noreen. Relax. I want to stop. Relax. Stop. Come back stop. to Noreen. To come back to Noreen, be relaxed. James, we want Noreen to take just a little break from being psychic at this point. When we hit upon something that's stressful or painful, sometimes we have to do this so we don't lose Noreen completely. So I'm going to ask her to take... In her trance-like state, Noreen envisioned two possible suspects. She described their facial appearances, a big man with thin hair, small eyes, round, narrow shoulders, and baggy jeans, and a smaller man with curly hair, and a broad nose. Listening along, a police sketch artist drew their composite pictures. That winter, nearly to the day since Kelly was last seen, Gilmer Police Chief Al McAllister unveiled the drawings and asked for the public's help finding the two men, while noting that information from psychics is not admissible in court. 
This really was presented to the town to try to find who might have been behind Kelly's disappearance. They had, at the end of that year, Wes, the girl disappeared on January 5th of 92. On New Year's Eve, they had a press conference at the, where the police station was then. And they got so desperate that they had uh, looked up a psychic out of Florida. And this woman from this psychic in Florida, based on her description, they had drawings there of two men. And um, they said, if anybody knows these people, the police chief said, we'd like to hear from them or words to that effect. So the case was not just put in a drawer and shoved to the back. This was nearly a year later uh, to the day, in fact. It lacked five days being here to the day, and they were still trying to solve it. Phone calls flooded in from people who thought they recognized the police sketches. They didn't lead to any arrest, though. None of us knew it at the time, but Sergeant Brown did have a different lead, or maybe a hunch. He'd zeroed in on the guys Kelly had been dating prior to her disappearance. Of particular interest was Chris Denton, a fellow senior at Gilmer High School. But neither Chris nor any of Kelly's other exes looked like the suspects in the police sketch. We'll go deeper into Chris Denton's story later in the series. He was once named publicly as the chief suspect, but they never could apparently get the goods of him. He was never charged. By this point, as far as most of us knew, James Brown was still a trusted member of law enforcement. But he also had a life outside of work, and Sergeant Brown had met someone. He was just a real outgoing, kind person. He was tall, in good shape. He was handsome to me, and uh, his personality, you know, is really what won me over because he was just a real kind individual. This is Penny. She was soon to be Penny Brown. She was uh, working on that case when I met him. Um, I wasn't familiar with that case at all. Um, He didn't share cases, case files with me. I'd say maybe about a month after I met him, we started dating. And, uh, We really enjoyed each other's company. Real happy, outgoing, hardworking person. By this time, the search for Kelly was entering its second year, and it really seemed to be going nowhere. But James and Penny were in love. In November 1993, just 10 months after the couple met, they got married at the local Methodist church. Oh, I was ecstatic. I was really happy. (laughs) Very happy. We returned from our honeymoon and I we both went back to work and this trying to think I don't know if it was a month later or a month and a half later but I was uh, at home with my daughter and uh, he had gone out of town to a school it had to do with law enforcement James Brown had been at law enforcement training in College Station, three and a half hours south of Gilmer, when a SWAT team descended on the training facility and took him into custody. Penny was back home in Gilmer when she heard a knock on the door. The chaplain came by my house and told me that he was either arrested or was going to be arrested for the kidnapping, rape, and murder of Kelly Wilson. And I was uh, dumbfounded. (laughs) I was just blown away. It was very shocking. The sensational news of James Brown's arrest tore through East Texas and beyond. Everybody was stunned. It turns out there was another investigation going on at the same time as the search for Kelly, an investigation that led not just to Sergeant Brown, but to seven other men and women who were already in jail on other terrible charges. Almost two years to the day after Kelly disappeared from the downtown square in Gilmer, Texas, the police sergeant who was supposed to be leading the search was instead thrown in jail, indicted in the kidnapping, sexual assault, and death of Kelly Day Wilson. Brown showed no emotion and made no comment as he passed through the hallway leading to the jail. Brown's bond is $650,000. The murder, kidnapping, and rape of 17-year-old Kelly Wilson. I'm innocent. 
I, uh, I'm looking forward to a, a court date just as soon as possible so that the truth can come out and I can be acquitted. Maybe even more shocking, if that's possible, was how and why Brown and these other folks had supposedly pulled off a crime more heinous than any of us could have imagined. It's feared she was kidnapped, raped, and murdered by a group locals are calling a satanic cult, and that Kelly may have actually been eaten in a ritualistic killing. For the past two years, Sergeant James Brown has been the only investigator on the Wilson case. It was a job he volunteered for. Now he's a suspect in her disappearance. Devil Town is a production of Imperative Entertainment. It was written and created by me, Wes Ferguson. Executive producer is Jason Hoke. Audio engineering and editing by Shane Freeman and Jason Hoke. Original score is by Robert Ellis. Recording by Austin Sisler at Eastside Studios. If you like the show, leave a review and don't forget to tell your friends. Thanks for listening.